I had a couple action-packed days, but I really thought that I'd take a minute to make a little video and talk about taking your thoughts captive and how absolutely crucial that is to our well-being. And, you know, we have to be able to distance ourselves from not only the devil and his thoughts, but also the voice of the lust of the flesh, walking after the flesh, all the, the lust of the flesh, everything. I'm not just talking about one thing here. I'm talking about all of it. So <clears throat> all those appetites, passions, emotions, and desires that God gave us that are good, that we twist and turn bad. <laughs> so um, the, the voice of the flesh our carnal nature, it has a voice. And we have to be able to take that thought captive if we're gonna be overcomers. And so I was thinking, sorry, even about having evil imaginations against the Lord, I started going after my evil imaginations against the Lord a really long time ago, 40 years ago, <clears throat> when one of the first honest things I ever said to the Lord was, I think you put this man in my life to kill me, right? You know, I, I, I realized that I had a lot going on in my head, but I didn't have it carved in my heart. And I needed God's word to somehow get from here to here. So I started being honest with my evil imaginations. Even when I actually met Gene and talked to him for the first time, I actually believed if you gave your life to the Lord, you were gonna to be totally overcome by the devil. It was like open season with demonic activity because a lot of Christians say that, and it's it's just the opposite. It's, it's open season with the devil when there's no guard over your heart, when you're totally lost in the land of, of lust. I'm gonna call that just Satan's dimension of life. When you look at all the devil's words in the Bible, he's the king of the land of lust, and Jesus is the king of the land of love. So there's two opposing governments. And it's very important to be able to identify the voice of the devil, what he's actually saying to us, and what the voice of the flesh, that three-year-old brat, is trying to say to us. Even one time I read the scripture, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. I said, Lord, I don't believe that. And you know what? I wasn't very righteous and neither did I care about being in right standing with God and it's like he opened my eyes you know the more you really care about being right with me because of what you say what you think the more you'll actually believe it <laughs> it's when we do the word that we reap the benefits of it not we all want to reap the benefits first before we are doers but there's a lot of scriptures about that that's not really the subject so <clears throat> I wrote some kind of heavy things today. I wanted to talk about them a little because one of the scriptures, this is in a few different places, but it talks about how perilous times will come because we're lovers of pleasure. We're three-year-old pleasure seekers more than lovers of the Father. And so we'll feed our other people when we're carnal and we're earthly and we're sensual and we're getting devilish input. <laughs> I need to play, I need the lust of the flesh, I need to care about, I need to love money, I need to love pleasure. You know, look, look at little kids, right? <laughs> Leave a little kid to themselves, they'll ruin the world, and that's kind of what's happening in this world. So it's the three-year-olds that people don't have any authority over. So um, there's another scripture that puts it this way, that iniquity is conceived and it gives forth birth. So we have to know where our thoughts are coming from and where they're taking us, right? So is this the voice of the flesh? Is this the three-year-old brat talking to me right now? It's trying, this a little Hitler trying to take me down because it just wants to eat, play, and have fun and, you know, forget everything else, right? Forget how we love our brother. So the devil has a strong voice. The voice of the flesh is strong, too. And really, if you read Romans 8, 
it's so cool because it talks about the benefits of walking after the Spirit, which I'm going to end this with a little revelation I got just tonight. So um, I, I thought about this today. It says, be careful, little eyes, what you see. It talks about that in the Bible, too. It's not just a song or a saying, but be careful, little ears, what you hear. And we can swallow down the wrong gospel. I spoke the wrong gospel. I spoke words of fretting, fainting, fear, unbelief that came from that spiritual dimension of not only baby thinking, but also demonic thinking. And it left me in a really, really dark place. This is why I talk about this so much, because we're living in a world where people are depressed, they're overcome, they don't have victory. And, you know, I have a lot of understanding to that at this point. So... Uh, there's also a scripture that says this, if you have naughty ears, you'll hear the wrong thing too. Naughty ears listen to the wrong gospel. So when we want to be fulfill all the lusts of the flesh, whatever those are, we're going to have naughty ears to hear the voice of the flesh in other people. And when we're content, fretting and whining and fainting, and feeling slighted by God, that really is the voice of the devil. When you just read what the devil said to Jesus and what the devil said to Eve, you can kind of get the whole nature of the beast of feeling slighted. You need to be boss, baby. You need to decide what's good. You know, he turned Eve into being a little spoiled brat <laughs> that thought she should decide what's good and evil and fulfill all the lust of the flesh, right? Smart guy. He knew just what to say. And he was an angel of light, and he was called beautiful. So she, uh, she definitely got deceived. So when the wrong gospel is coming out of our mouth, the book of Revelations calls it like leaping frogs that are on a mission to evangelize other people. So I've been thinking about false gospels and how the people that have gone astray from the Lord and backslidden is because they've spoken the wrong words and they've eaten the wrong words of somebody else. Bad diet. Bad diet will kill your health spiritually. So it'll kill your health physically too. So the gospel that Jesus heard in the desert when he was in the wilderness of his soul and he was very empty he hadn't eaten for a long time, drank for a long time. It was the perfect time for Satan to come give him the gospel, right? And he was actually preaching to him in the New Testament. There's a scripture that says, the way of Cain. They went greedily after the way of Cain. What was that? They were sensual. They were earthly. Same thing, the reason, reason the um, desert swallowed up the children of Israel. They were murmuring. They were complaining. They just wanted to party and eat and play, right? They didn't care about doing God's will. So it's really cool to care about doing God's will too. It's not too hard and it's not evil. But that's why we have to go after those evil imaginations or we'll think it's too hard and we'll think it's evil. So the, the Lord actually made it us to be comfort junkies. We were made to need comfort. But the Holy Ghost is the supreme comforter and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and truth were made to fire us up with comfort. So appetites are good. There's a lot of things that are good, but when it takes us over and takes away our relationship with the Holy Spirit of truth, the greatest comforter, we're setting our affection on the things of the world, not our affection on, on the things of the Lord which makes us kind of bad friends to other people. So ordered appetites, passions, emotions, and desires are really given by God. That's why the earth gets populated, and it's why we're willing to keep eating, because we have a God-given appetite. So, um, But when, when we use food to fix our problems, it becomes our demise. It kills us. Food never fixes problems never not once not ever unless you're eating good food and it's fixing your health i'm talking about 
using food for spiritual issues, for the issues of life that come from the heart. Food never fixes those issues. So we bite into lies, right? We believe lies. The devil only has the power of lies to take us out. So if we don't take our thoughts captive, if we don't understand the power of the lie, that's why Jesus said, if you're going to pray, pray this way. Pray that my kingdom would come, my government, my will would be done in your life because that's the ultimate highest good that any of us can do is his will, not our own. And, you know, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from what's evil. Deliver us from lies. Help us to overcome lies, not be overcome by lies. And that's why it's so important to be able to separate the devils outside the door. Even the three-year-old brat is outside the door of our spiritual mind, which is the mind of God. You know, Jesus has given us everything we need towards life and godliness. He's given us his word. And I don't want to make this too long. And man, it's already going longer than I wish, but we're comfort junkies. And there's a lot of ways we can actually be comforted, not only by wisdom and understanding and knowledge and the spirit of truth. There's ways we can actually, God made us to be comforted by taking care of flowers, taking care of pets, whatever it is. So um, the most, the thing that God created us for the most was to be fired up by wisdom and understanding and knowledge though. So there's nothing more that actually comforts us. And when we've been comforted by the spirit of truth, we can comfort others. We won't kill them with the law. We won't oppress them. We won't be mean to them. We won't, you know, be condemning or unforgiving towards them. We'll be able to give them the comfort of God that comforted us. So the comfort of the spirit of truth that can make us free is very powerful. And anybody you know, any friend you have at all that is willing to get this day their daily bread and not live by bread alone is your best friend. Is the friends that you should keep and have, they're the most precious. How lovely on the are the feet of them that bring good news, that bring truth to you, to help you overcome the devil and the little flesh brat. Flesh brat. So Jeremiah 17 says this, I, the Lord, search your heart. I try your reins. I try what's leading you, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. How wonderful it is that we can actually be tried, that Jesus loves us enough to help us like any father. You know, he wants to direct our paths. So we go into the land of blessings, right? It's not because he's evil and he's a withholder and he's going to torture us and ruin our life and make us grovel through the desert. And, you know, that's what I thought. You give your life to the Lord, you end up in Africa naked, serving naked Africans, you know, because that's what's really holy and godly. And so my perception of the Father was all wrong. And the only way I could start seeing who God really was was to tell the truth tell about what I really believed and thought about him. People that don't do that get stuck. They get stuck in less, less world, live for pleasures more than God. You know, they live for money more than God. They live for all of it more than God because they believe lies about God. So, um, so Jesus loves us enough to help us out of the land of living lives that are choking us to death. He wants to direct our paths so he can torture us, so he can make us starve and not have what we need. No, I don't think so. So this life we're living is like a dress rehearsal. Gene Sullivan didn't tell me that, but he kind of indicated that to me the other day, that we're, we're in a dress rehearsal. And that dress rehearsal is for a much bigger arena, an eternal one, for an eternal movie. And, and this is so powerful because I can have my own fear of the future, fear of me getting old, fear of him getting old, what's how that's going to play out, you know. I have to really guard my heart against those kind of thoughts. And I've even gotten much greater revelation about that just tonight. You know, and I had a deep conversation with him the other night where he was talking about, because he's been a military man and he's had a lot of discipline in his life and he was raised with a mom that not only had faith, and she'd have a poverty spirit and a covetous spirit and a, 
and a stingy mentality. That helped him a lot too, to believe God's good nature. So we were having a, a governmental discussion because let your government come, right? Let your kingdom come, your government. And Gene's been part of a government. And he's when he lost his life for the government of this world to the government of the kingdom, he understood it in a way probably a lot of people don't understand it. But the fear of death thing, you know what I realized because of what he was saying, he was like giving me a, a vision for how powerful heaven is going to be and how cool it is. And we're, in a sense, we're, we're dying like children in a womb here that are going to be born into something else that's glorious, that was worth everything we went through here on earth to get to and to be part of because it's going to be so cool. And so though our outward man is perishing, it's like a baby in a womb that's perishing to be born again. That's what the death process is like. It's almost like the same death process of a fetus in a womb. And you know, those who have this hope that there's something really, really cool going on that is so far beyond what we can think or know, and there's scriptures about that too, that we can't even conceive what God has prepared for those that love him. So I hope this has encouraged you tonight. I, I'm tired, I don't look very good anymore, but I wanted to just say these things because I thought maybe they would help somebody. So I hope you're one of those people that they helped, amen.